everybody, so today we're going to be discussing the potential of gene therapy for treating tinnitus. Now, as I've mentioned before in my previous videos, um, I noticed, I guess throughout my studies, that the role of inhibitory interneurons in the dorsal and ventral cochlear nucleus is extremely important when it comes to bringing the tinnitus down. And one of my theories as to how the Susan Shore device works in the long run is the desynchronization that occurs between the SP5 and the fusiform and cartwheel cell pathways actually restores the excitatory and inhibitory balance to an extent, allowing the cartwheel cells to function normally and suppress the hyperactivity in the fusiform cells. You guys all know about the cochlear nuclei, more specifically the dorsal cochlear nucleus and the ventral cochlear nucleus. Now, for those who have already watched a lot of my videos, this might be a little bit boring because you already know what these do. But just in case we have some new viewers here, the dorsal cochlear nucleus is the integration hub or the multimodal integration hub in the brainstem. It receives somatosensory input, uh, from various pathways, the most prevalent in my opinion being the SP5 pathway, and it integrates these sensory or somatosensory inputs together with the auditory input from the auditory nerve fiber to aid in processing sound better, like sound localization, etc., etc. Or when you have your head turned, for example, uh, sound obviously does change from that as well. The ventral cochlear nucleus has a different function, and it is actually anatomically close to the dorsal cochlear nucleus, but it does not directly connect with it. But they do share information, so to speak, through commissural connections, uh, which are axonal projections onto opposite sides of the uh, brainstem or across different regions of the same side. But uh, that's not really important for our current video. Just basically keep in mind that the dorsal cochlear nucleus processes sound in general, like the frequencies, for example, and the ventral cochlear nucleus uh, processes precise timing and intensity of sounds. And spontaneous firing or hyperactivity uh, or hypersynchrony in the dorsal cochlear nucleus is responsible mostly for the tinnitus generation, while hyperactivity or spontaneous firing in the ventral cochlear nucleus, according to Susan Shore's research, is mostly or partially responsible for hyperacusis. Now, the cells that we're going to be talking about today are, of course, the fusiform cells in the DCN, which are excitatory neurons that project further up the auditory pathway, cartwheel cells, or the inhibitory interneurons that release uh, GABA or glycine, which are inhibitory neurotransmitters, and they basically keep the fusiform cells in check. Um, there's also the vertical cells uh, in the DCN, which are another type of inhibitory interneuron, and they basically help refine auditory signals and uh, control spontaneous firing rates as well. Now, um, bushy cells in the ventral cochlear nucleus are the excitatory projection neurons that are important in loudness perception, and the destellate cells in the ventral cochlear nucleus uh, provide the wideband inhibition that help uh, limit runaway activity across various frequencies. Now, when inhibitory control by cartwheel, vertical, or destillate cells uh, weakens due to noise, trauma, excitotoxic damage, etc., etc., all the information in my previous videos, the excitatory neurons like the fusiform cells can fire too often or become synchronized. That's the basis of tinnitus. Now, the reason why we should focus on inhibitory interneurons for gene therapy is uh, the information that I mentioned previously, aka reduced inhibition. Now, if cartwheel or vertical cells can't do their jobs, uh, fusiform cells, of course, will send abnormally strong signals to higher regions. And like I mentioned in my previous video, um, the larger the cluster of fusiform cells that are synchronized and hyperactive, the less of a chance that the uh, medial geniculate body in the thalamus would be able to filter it properly as uh, aberrant noise. Now, strengthening or restoring the inhibitory circuits is definitely the key to breaking the vicious cycle of hypersynchrony, hyperactivity, and, of course, maladaptive uh, feedback loops. 
Now, the Susan Shore device is a synchrony buster, as I mentioned in my previous video, um, quoting one member of the community who called it this way. Um, now, what it actually does, it decreases the synchronization, um, the aberrant synchronization between the somatosensory pathways and the fusiform cells and cartwheel cells. And this can and does, um, in most cases, uh, decrease the hyperactivity overall, uh, or the clusters of fusiform cells that are synchronized decrease, which then would allow the medial genoclid body to filter this aberrant activity or this aberrant spontaneous firing as, you know, nonsense noise in the auditory pathway. Now, while the Susan Shore device does provide uh, long-term changes in aberrant synchronization in the auditory pathway, uh, it does not actually decrease the hyperactivity of the cells themselves. Now, when when people use the Susan Shore device, of course, uh, they're hoping that, or we are hoping, that this decrease of synchrony would actually lead to the increase of homeostatic plasticity or the um, self-regulation, basically, of the inhibitory and excitatory neurons in the DCN to recover their normal activity. Now back to cartwheel cells. Now when cartwheel cells or vertical cells cannot do their job properly, uh, the fusiform cells will obviously send abnormally strong signals to the higher region. Um, now in the ventral cochlear nucleus, the destellate cells and other inhibitory interneurons serve a similar role, um, preventing bushy cells from overreacting. And boosting inhibition there might help hyperacusis. Now, gene therapy is all about delivering missing or enhancing genes into specific neurons. If we increase inhibitory neurotransmitters like GABA or glycine through genes that make these chemicals or help them work better, the overall hyperactivity can definitely calm down. And if we improve ion channel function, like potassium channels, uh, like KCNQ or HCN channels, we can stabilize the resting potentials and reduce random firing. And as we know through my previous videos and through Thanos Sinopolis' research, ion channel function is very important when it comes to either maladaptive or homeostatic plasticity. A quick little reminder as to what these things are. Maladaptive plasticity are changes in the nervous system that disrupt normal function. Um, harmful changes, so to speak, like tinnitus, uh, abnormal sensory processing, uh, visual snow syndrome, chronic pain, all of that. And homeostatic plasticity is the opposite. It's the nervous system's ability to maintain stability by balancing neural activity in response to changes. Like, for example, when a person's brain cells die from drinking a lot of alcohol, uh, the brain will restore the balance and adapt the uh, synaptic connections, for example, uh, or change the neural activity in general um, to restore the normal function. If the brain did not have this ability, people would just die after a night out drinking for example. Now back to gene therapy. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about viral vectors. Now what are viral vectors? Um, now viruses naturally insert genetic material into cells. Uh, and what scientists do is they repurpose them into quote-unquote vectors that carry therapeutic genes but remove harmful parts so they don't cause disease, for example. Now, common examples are AAV, or adeno-associated virus. And this one's really popular because it's relatively safe and good at infecting neurons. There is also lentivirus, which uh, can integrate into the genome for stable expression, but it does require very careful safety checks. Now, if we were to ensure that we only affect, say, cartwheel cells, the inhibitory interneurons, and not every other neuron, uh, we could use cell-specific promoters. 
Now, what a cell-specific promoter is, uh, it's like a molecular address uh, telling the introduced gene to turn on only in certain cell types. For inhibitory neurons, promoters for GABA-making enzymes, in other words, GAD65-67, or glycine transporters, like GLY-T2, can guide expression specifically into those inhibitory cells. Uh, basically, overall, the vector plus the promoter combination is engineered to infect cells, but only switch on in the exact neuron type we want to modify. Being, of course, inhibitory into neurons, both in the VCN and the DCN. Now, what specific genes would we insert? Now, to enhance inhibitory neurotransmitters, uh, we would have to um, overexpress GAD, or glutamic acid decarboxylase. Um, it's the enzyme that converts glutamate into GABA. And overexpressing GAD could elevate GABA levels in cartwheel or vertical cells thus, of course, boosting the inhibition onto fusiform cells. Now, another gene would be GLY-T2, or glycine transporter 2. Um, this helps maintain glycine reuptake and packaging. More glycine could mean better inhibitory signals. Now, about KCNQ2-3 channels, which are the potassium channels that prevent excessive firing by stabilizing the resting membrane potential. Um, now, overexpressing functional KCNQ subunits in hyperactive fusiform cells, for example, might calm them down as well. And of course, modulating the genes responsible for HCN channels could help regulate rhythmic firing uh, and prevent neurons from becoming overly excitable. This is specifically interesting of an approach for the thalamus uh, due to the significance of rhythmic firing there. There is also designer receptors or dreads or optogenetics. Now, dreads are specifically engineered receptors that respond only to a designer drug. And if we put an inhibitory dread into fusiform cells, we could turn them off by administering that drug. Alternatively, we could put excitatory dreads into inhibitory neurons, uh, giving us an, you know, kind of a uh, boost of inhibition. Now, another one is optogenetics. Now, not so sure about this one because it's used mostly in research, not in practice, but embedding light-sensitive proteins or opsins um, so that we can activate or silence neurons with specific wavelengths of light is possible. Um, this is really experimental, but definitely something that could be um, analyzed. Now, how would such a therapy be done? Um, unfortunately, it is quite invasive and does require quite a lot of imaging, but it is very plausible. So uh, first you would do a detailed um, scan to localize the dorsal or ventral cochlear nucleus. Uh, the lab engineers would uh, create the virus, or AAV, with a promoter for inhibitory cells like GAD65, or a therapeutic gene like for the KCNQ2 or GAD67, and of course, uh, massive safety checks to ensure that it won't harm other brain regions. Now, the delivery methods would be through a stereotactic injection. So a neurosurgeon would use advanced imaging to guide a tiny microscopic needle or a micro pipette into the DCN or VCN region, injecting a small volume of the vector. Uh, now, some viral vectors can be placed near the round window of the cochlea. Uh, and um, though the targeting of the DCN might be less direct then, but it's of course much less invasive. Injection, the virus uh, would infect the targeted neurons 
and start making the desired protein. This can take a few weeks to stabilize. Uh, and of course, the patient would be monitored for side effects like inflammation or off-target uh, expression. Now, if DREDS were used, the patient might receive an oral medication that specifically activates or inhibits uh, these newly expressed uh, receptors. Now, of course, all of this doesn't come with uh, potential challenges. Um, brainstem injections are extremely delicate uh, and very surgically complex. Uh, the DCN does sit near the cerebellum, so you have to be extremely precise. Um, there are, of course, risks of off-target effects, uh, like minimum expression outside the intended neurons. Um, and of course, the inserted gene should remain stable and safe without triggering immune responses. Now, for those who are wondering, how would you target specifically the hyperactive fusiform cells or the underactive inhibitory interneurons? Well, um, that's a complex question, and the dorsal cochlear nucleus is physically layered, and each layer corresponds to a more or less narrow frequency band. Um, there are possible approaches to target specific hyperactive fusiform cell clusters. Um, they are very complex, and I'm not really sure I should go into this in this video. Uh, but here's a couple of them. For example, you could use advanced electrophysiological mapping uh, to identify the hotspot or the layer that responds to the tinnitus frequency. Another one is retrograde or anterograde tracers, uh, which are tracers that can be injected into the cochlear nerve region, um, which corresponds to the frequency of tinnitus. And the travel and the tracer travels up to the DCN to those regions that it is tonotopically matched to. Now another idea uh, would be while delivering the viral vector, um, you could present tone bursts at the tinnitus frequency. And if the vector includes an activity-dependent element, the neurons that are most active, or the 8 kilohertz, for example, cluster, will preferentially express the therapeutic gene. Now, of course, all of this is purely hypothetical, and a lot of things must be researched much more in depth to make this treatment a viable option. Uh, for example, refining the tonotopic mapping, um, or, you know, to create high-definition tonotopic atlases, so to speak, uh, of the DCN in humans for pinpoint accuracy. Um, and the activity-dependent vectors I mentioned previously are not that well explored or researched. And of course, all of this would require a lot of funding and, of course, uh, scaling from animal models to humans. Now to conclude, um, the heart or base of the concept is if we can identify the frequency-specific patch of overactive neurons and restore local inhibitory control, tinnitus might be suppressed directly and permanently, hopefully. Now, uh, while the, all of this is largely in the research and development phase, I think the potential is huge. And someday, targeting inhibitory interneurons um, could revolutionize how we treat this. Now, many of you are probably wondering why all of this, if Susan Shore's device can, you know, decrease the hypersynchrony. While the Susan Shore device uh, probably will not work for absolutely everybody, and this is just another novel approach that is possible in the future to address this issue more directly, without having to rely solely on the body's homeostatic capabilities or on uh, the thalamic gating mechanisms being in order. 
That's about it for today. Uh, if you have any further questions or want to discuss anything else, definitely join the Discord server that will be linked in the description.